Now we want to look more systematically at Plato's ethics, having laid the overall foundations. But first I want to backtrack in time for a moment and say a few words about Socrates' views on ethics. Now Socrates, as I said, was Plato's teacher. And he developed certain ethical views of his own, rather generalized but still very important, and they were subsequently taken up and developed by Plato, and in a different way also by Aristotle. Now I will not give you a full presentation of Socrates' views this evening. I'll concentrate for the most part only on those which are essentially valid, mentioning an occasional error but not focusing on it. Socrates was a champion, as I mentioned last week, of an absolute, objective, universal code of ethical principles. He was an arch opponent of the sophists. He believed that ethics was a science, not a matter of feelings and impulses. Now, he never worked out a full system of ethics, but he had leads to it. Perhaps his most important lead was the parallel he was fond of drawing between the soul and the body. Now consider for a moment the body. It obviously has a definite nature. And there are therefore definite conditions that have to be fulfilled to keep it healthy. And there are definite <coughs> sciences whose function is to determine those conditions. There is in the Greek world gymnastics, the method of taking care of and exercising the body to keep it healthy, and medicine, the method of curing its various ailments. Now there are certain options. You can do sit-ups or push-ups, for instance, or eat uh, one kind of food with so and so many vitamins or another kind which has the same number. There are options, but the principles of bodily care are mandatory and not optional. If you disobey them, you have a diseased, sick body. And of course, notice certain things may give you temporary pleasure, for instance, dope or poison. But there is nevertheless an objective basis for declaring that these things are wrong because they subvert the life of the individual. They destroy his body. The result is that after a few flickers of pleasure, we have the ravaged dope addict, the alcoholic with DTs, etc. The general rule is definite physical conditions universally have to be met to achieve physical health and therefore true bodily welfare. And this requires you to tend your body scientifically, to exercise reason and self-control as against acting on any whim or urge you get. Now for Socrates, and he was the first really to emphasize this. The same is true of the soul. Now by the soul we mean here, in the context of Socrates, the psychological or spiritual element in man. The soul has a definite nature, and there are definite conditions required for it to be healthy. The universal conditions deriving from the nature of the soul. In modern terms, we don't talk about an unhealthy soul, but we recognize the phenomenon he was referring to. We talk about a tortured neurotic, a psychotic, a man who is anxious, guilty, depressed, self-doubtful, torn by conflicts, etc. Well, that's what Socrates would call a sick soul. And uh, you must live a certain way if you are to have a healthy soul, as proved by the fact that there are such things as sick souls. You have to live virtuously. Now you must understand what the Greeks mean by virtue. They use it simply to mean excellent performance of function. Whatever the function happens to be, if the function of a knife is to cut, then a sharp knife is a virtuous knife. It's a knife which is, has the virtue or power of being able to perform its function. A virtuous man, therefore, is a man who performs his function correctly and looks after his soul accordingly. The actual, you mustn't associate virtue as used by any of the Greeks with the meaning it came to have under Christianity. Uh, uh, virtue, the actual word that we use, is the same root as virility. And V-I-R is, of course, Latin for man. Now, it is a, as someone once pointed out, it's a fascinating commentary on the development of civilization <coughs> that the word virtue passed from meaning a manliness in a man to chastity in a woman. Uh, that is the legacy of Christianity. <laughs> in any event, ethics for Socrates is the science of achieving health in the soul. It is on the level of the soul what gymnastics and medicine is on the level of the body. And therefore, there are objective, absolute principles of ethics, just as there are in the case of the body. If you follow them, you will achieve happiness. 
but Socrates insists and Plato and Aristotle agree with him that there are therefore definite conditions imposed by human nature for the achievement of happiness. It is not, they all insist, a matter of acting on any desire you happen to have. Happiness has objective universal conditions. Now of course today it's bromide, that people can achieve happiness any way they choose, that it's arbitrary, uh, subjective, etc. But of course the Greeks are right, not the sophist Greeks, but the main line from Socrates on, are right in this viewpoint. It is not true that the way to achieve happiness is to have any arbitrary desire and then simply satisfy it. The proof of that is endless. <coughs> Without the right uh, psychological conditions, you can have a passion for money and acquire it and end up in miserable Park Avenue neurotic. Or a passion for fame and acquire it and end up a movie star on a Beverly Hills couch in psychotherapy forever or a passion for love and acquire it and end up one of those uh, self-doubting neurotics who feels that he's a fraud and worthless and the love simply makes him feel worse. Socrates is right, misery is the consequence of a diseased or unvirtuous or unjust soul. So he, along with the Greeks in general, demand proof when you say about a man he's happy. They take that as an achievement because it means he is a completely moral man. They do not sling the term happiness the way the moderns do. And therefore, if somebody tells three jokes at a party and gets roaring drunk, they do not say he is happy. They say he is having a temporary titillation. <coughs> <laughs> and they clearly distinguish there's two different Greek words, one meaning pleasure, one meaning happiness. Uh, pleasure is hedone, from which we get hedonism. And happiness is eudaimonia, which is the much broader term encompassing the whole condition of the soul. Now it follows from Socrates' view <coughs> that no man can really be harmed by anybody else. And he says this. Because in the basic sense, the crucial determinant of his soul and of his state is up to him, how he conducts himself. Nobody can make you unhappy in this fundamental sense. Now here we must distinguish, as he did, between what we can call inner and outer happiness. Uh, the external conditions, how people treat you, and your inner state. Now Socrates, for instance, as Plato, depicts him as a man of inner tranquility, peace of mind, serenity. He has a healthy soul. Now if true, other people can defame him, rob him, even kill him. But in this deep sense, they cannot get to him. They can't destroy his inner serenity. And conversely, they cannot give you happiness in any basic sense. They can give you money, fame, love, etc., but not the inner harmony or health which makes them enjoyable. Now, I should say, ideally, for the Greeks, it's nice to have both the inner and the outer. But the crucial thing is the inner, because that's what determines your whole direction. The crucial thing is to have a healthy soul. Not just life, but the good life. Never to commit injustice no matter what. Never to commit evil, because evil is like poison, in a literal sense. It brings only suffering and self-destruction in its wake. That's the substance of the Socratic co contribution to ethics. Now there's one more crucial Socratic point, And that is that virtue requires knowledge. In the same way that medicine, or architecture, or any practical art requires knowledge. It is a very common device for Socrates to draw a parallel between the various practical arts and ethics, the art of living. It requires knowledge, knowledge of the proper end and of the means to it. And thus Socrates' famous principle, virtue is knowledge. Virtue is knowledge. Now what exactly did he mean by virtue is knowledge? As far as we can judge, he meant two quite different things. One of them I would say correct, the other false. Both packaged deal together in this famous statement. The first is that knowledge is a necessary condition of virtue. Knowledge, of course, of what is required for the health of the soul. <coughs> and here, this is obviously correct. And there's an exact parallel, for instance, to architecture. 
uh, if you don't have any knowledge, you will not be able to build uh, sensibly. It's simply be a matter of chance, and you're building nine chances out of ten will topple if you even get it up. Uh, the same thing for Socrates is true of the art of living. If you do not know the principles by which to live, you simply are going to have a life which collapses instead of a building. That's part point one under virtuous knowledge. Apparently, however, Socrates also believed a second point under this formula, namely that knowledge is a sufficient condition of virtue. In other words, that if you know what is right, you will automatically and necessarily do it. You have no choice about it. There is no such thing as deliberate evil, simply ignorance. Now, how did he claim to prove that knowledge is all that's required and itself guarantees virtue? Well, his argument is like this. He says, virtue, uh, rather, everyone necessarily pursues that which he thinks is going to lead to his own welfare, to his self-interest, to his own good, to his happiness. Now I should say here an explanation of this view of his that uh, Socrates, along with most of the Greeks, assumed simply without question that of course all men are egoists and want to achieve their own happiness. This is wrong, but uh, uh, it simply is an evidence of the fact of the comparative health of the Greek culture. Now if you combine that premise with Socrates' definition of virtue, namely that which is indispensable to a man's welfare, the conclusion follows unavoidably that everyone who knows what virtue is and sees that it leads to his welfare will necessarily pursue it and live the good life, because the only alternative would be he's deliberately and willfully pursuing his own destruction. And of course, according to the Greeks, that is impossible. Therefore, said Socrates, everyone who doesn't live the good life does not know the nature and rewards of virtue. Sin is simply ignorance. There's no such thing as a willful evil. Once you know the good, you cannot betray it. All wrongdoing is involuntary. And thus you see the urgent importance of studying philosophy for Socrates. It gives you the knowledge that makes you good, and therefore makes you healthy, and therefore makes you happy. The study of philosophy is therefore the key, the only key, to a successful life. Now I have to literally, in a few sentences, demur from this last element of the virtuous knowledge view, the idea that it is sufficient of itself to guarantee uh, virtue. Um, it has had a very negative, very bad effect, this uh, latter view, because the effect has been to wipe out the distinction between errors of knowledge and breaches of morality. There is no such thing as volitionally immoral behavior on this view, simply involuntary ignorance. And today, of course, there's all sorts of people exonerating or trying to exonerate all sorts of crimes on the grounds of, well, he couldn't help it, he wasn't educated, he didn't know any better. If he'd had the right knowledge, he would have been okay. You're familiar with that. Now, of all the possible criticisms you could make of this view, I'll confine myself to two very briefly. It assumes, first of all, as I mentioned, that all men are irrational egoists, acting always for what they believe will be their own welfare something which is simply demonstrably false. Uh, anyone who knew the history of Christianity, which of course Socrates didn't have the chance to know, would see that. And I don't mean to pick just on Christianity, atheists are no better. Uh, you could just look around the state of the world or read any newspaper as far as this point is concerned. To become a rational egoist is an achievement, not an innate endowment. Uh, human beings are not determined. And, of course, this would be a version of determinism, Socrates' view. They're not determined to be rational or irrational, egoistic or non-egoistic. There are men who are actually indifferent to their own personal lives and happiness. There are men, if you go by the facts, who are positively eager to destroy themselves, to sacrifice themselves. Socrates' error is to project onto human nature the general pro-reason healthy egoism of the Greek civilization. It is a noble error, but it is an error. And another criticism. The fact that you know something does not mean that you will automatically apply that knowledge. You can know that something is good for you and yet refuse to allow that knowledge to come into focus. 
the point I give students in the school, which is the uh, perfect example of this, is you know there's going to be an exam tomorrow. You have the capacity simply to push that unpleasant fact out of your mind by an act of evasion and go out of focus. Now, you see, Socrates implies here, once you know your knowledge must always be operative. But if you understand the objectivist theory of free will, which I wouldn't here attempt to go into, essential to free will is that you not only have to know, you have to summon your knowledge and concentrate on it in a given situation by consistent acts of focusing. This is what Socrates leaves out. So he is right that when you know that something is the correct thing, and when you volitionally focus on that fact, keep it real to yourself, then and in that moment you have no choice but to act on uh, what uh, you know. But it doesn't follow that whenever you commit a wrong action, uh, you didn't have the knowledge. It could very well have been the case that you had the knowledge but chose to evade it. That's inherent in free will. Uh, you can never become an automatically good person just by stuffing yourself full of enough lectures on ethics. Well, so much for Socrates' views. You see that apart from certain errors, his general view is sound if undeveloped and generalized. It's true that man has a nature. Using his terms, the soul has a nature. It's true that happiness depends on having a healthy soul and living in accordance with your nature. That sophistic whim worshiping is uh, a means to guaranteed misery, and it's true that a knowledge of man's nature and requirements is indispensable to virtue and happiness. But we don't yet have anything very specific. We have to know, well, what is the specific nature of man or the soul? What are its requirements? What are the laws of happiness? What is the knowledge we need? And thus we have to turn to Plato to fill in Socrates' generalized scheme and deduce a concrete set of virtues from it. And first, what then is Plato's view of the nature of man, the nature of the soul? And thus you can title this, if you're taking notes, Plato's psychology. Now that does not mean the workings of his mind. It means his theory of the nature of the soul, the nature of man. Psyche, P-S-Y-C-H-E, is the Greek for soul. And therefore, psychology is literally theory of the soul. You can think of it as theory of the personality, theory of the spiritual, psychological component of man. Now, to understand Plato's psychology, you need to remember his metaphysics. There is a sharp dualism between the world of perfect forms and the world of Heracletian particulars. Now, according to Plato, man is a creature who has ties to both worlds. He is a composite creature of two parts, soul and body. His soul, or his reason, belongs to another world. It came from there. It's non-material. Its essential function is to study the forms. But in this life, the soul is encased in the body. And as a result, man has drives, urges, desires that a disembodied soul would never have. He has loves and lusts for physical things. In a word, there is a part of man which urges him up to the world of forms to study, to think, to philosophize, and there is a part which pulls him down to this world, the part influenced by the body. And therefore, there must be two parts to man's personality, or two parts to the soul, if you like to call it that, reflecting the two different worlds. Man, for Plato, is a dualistic creature. He has a higher nature and a lower nature. All men. His higher nature is his reason, or call it his mind, the thinking part, the part that studies the forms and acquires knowledge. His lower nature is the irrational element in him, and that is the emotions, the feelings. Those, says Plato, are always feelings and emotions for things in this world, for the sensible world. And notice you do not feel passions for abstract forms. Emotions and desires are inherently this worldly. They're directed to particulars. You may feel a craving lust for bananas, but nobody feels a lust for banana hood, you see. So on this point, he's right. Emotions are directed to particulars. Now, these two elements, according to Plato, 
present in every man, they are fundamentally independent of each other and in fact opposed components, making up the essence of man's soul. Now notice they are opposed by nature. What is the proof of that? Well, it's what you can call the argument from conflict, which Plato puts forth in the Republic and which has been going like a house of fire ever since. It's perhaps best illustrated by the story of Philip and Mildred in Of Human Bondage, the supposedly illust illustrating the eternal conflict between man's reason and his passions. If you know that story, which I certainly don't propose to tell now except in one sentence, it amounts to he, uh, Philip is a, an artist and he meets Mildred, a green-tinted slut from the gutter, who, intellectually speaking, he finds repulsive, and yet he is caught in helpless emotional bondage to her. On the other hand, he meets Nora, a nice girl, and he <laughs> intellectually approves of, and he's completely indifferent to her sexually, emotionally. And he runs through the book wailing about the eternal plight of man, his emotions pull him one way and his reason the other. Now there's 10,000 such examples that the followers of Plato has, uh, have written, and I don't have to multiply them. Plato's argument is if a man like this is urged in two opposite directions at the same time, there must be two different opposite parts at work, two independent, autonomous, motivating sources, one pushing one way and one the other. Now you see here the influence of Plato's metaphysics. Because if you held a one reality metaphysics, you would never come to such a conclusion. You could easily account for conflicts without taking emotions as irrational elements severed from reason and functioning independently. You would do it by reference to contradictory ideas, contradictory premises which a person holds. And you would say the person holds a contradiction he is in intellectual conflict, and one half is usually not within his conscious awareness, but in principle, if he introspects properly, engages in self-analysis, perhaps goes to psychotherapy, he will be able to come bring it all to the surface, get rid of the contradiction, restore harmony to his emotional life, and proceed about his business. But if you come to man in advance with the metaphysics of dualism and conflict, you will find that conflict in man also. And for Plato, therefore, in every man's soul there is a basic conflict of reason versus emotion. It's a little bit more complicated because Plato proceeds to subdivide the lower emotional element itself into two parts, ending up uh, with three, two plus one, you see. The lowest element of the low part he calls the appetites. And those are the desires grossly, crudely tied to the physical world. The desires for physical things like food, shelter, wealth, money, sex. Then there is the higher part of the lower part, if, if you follow that. <laughs> and it's more or less intermediate. He calls it the spirit ted element, T-E-D, not the spiritual, because they're all spiritual in the sense of versus physical, but the spirit ted, the spirited element. <clears throat> and it is, in effect, the passional, more violent part of your emotional life. The part that is a little higher than the appetites, so quite a bit higher than the appetites, because it's not directly tied to physical things, but it's still oriented to this world, so of course it's nothing like the high part. Uh, it's responsible essentially for intense anger, indignation, ambition, hatred, the desire for power, honor, glory. Now, if you ask why he made this latter subdivision between the appetites and the spirited, it is the same argument from conflict. He observed that a man's sexual desire can point in one direction, and a man can feel violent anger at his own sexual desire, in which case his indignation, his spirited element, is aligning itself with his reason, let us say, and both of them are against his appetite. On the other hand, the spirited can jump in the other direction. It, so to speak, holds a balance of power in the soul. And if the voice of reason says, you shouldn't have that particular desire, and the spirited element chimes in with hatred for reason and lends its weight to the uh, appetites on top of it, well, then the man is pretty much cooked, you see. So the spirited is like an intermediary part that can go either way. Now you see here the obvious influence of Pythagoras. Remember the three men at the Olympic Games? 
the lover of gain, uh, the lover of glory and fame, and the spectator. Well, that has now been blown up, you see, into a full-fledged theory of human psychology. Plato's own analogy, analogy is that inside the skin of every man there are three creatures. A little man, and that represents the reason. A raging lion, and that represents the spirited. And a many-headed, slobbering, drooling beast. And that represents the appetites. Now, uh, those of you familiar with Freud will see that uh, there is a close correlation between Plato's trichotomy uh, here and Freud's. At least the id of Freud is simply Plato's appetites put into Latin. And Plato himself took the view that the appetites contain, among their other parts, such evil desires that they come out only in dreams, that we can't face them in real life. Now, I hasten to add, in defense of Plato, that Freud is a 19th century irrationalist. And that, uh, that uh, by comparison, Plato's trichotomy is a paragon of virtue uh, in relation to the Freudian corruption. If you're interested to know why I say that, I'll discuss that in the question period if you want. The upshot in any event is that for Plato, there is a tripartite soul, three parts. Three autonomous, separate, distinctive, independent sources of behavior. Three springs of action in man. So that man is inherently, metaphysically, by nature in conflict. His parts are inherently at war with one another. That's human nature. That is not neurosis. Now it is this psychological theory that sets the problem of ethics. And the problem is, in effect, how to achieve peace and harmony among these parts. Health of the soul for Plato will equal, in effect, peaceful coexistence among the man, the lion, and the many-headed beast. Ethics is the science because it's going to tell us how to do it. How should you live? How will you achieve <laughs> harmony of the soul and therefore happiness? Well, Plato says the answer lies in the fact that each of these three parts of the soul has a specific function a specific job to do, a specific purpose to serve in the organism as a whole. And if we grasp the function of each, that will guide us as to how to use each properly. The function of reason is obviously to acquire knowledge of the world of forms, and on the basis of this knowledge to rule the other parts of the personality, and therefore to guide man's life. The spirited and the appetitive element, of course, are blind. They respectively simply roar and drool. <laughs> it is only reason that can see the consequences of an action, the conditions of a goal that can plan long range, and it must therefore be reason that is ruling. Now, when a man's reason has acquired the knowledge and is ruling his life, the man as a whole, says Plato, has the virtue of wisdom. I might mention here as background that the Greeks recognized four cardinal virtues. The conventional Greeks. You know in the way in which today uh, in a Christian civilization you say uh, the main virtues are faith, hope, and charity. Well, uh, in Greece uh, the stand-ins for them, the conventional virtues, were wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice. It was a better civilization. Um, <laughs> Well, Plato is going to show how he can accommodate these standard four according to his particular scheme. Now, the spirited element, what is its function? Well, essentially, it is the executive element of the personality. It's the part that incites you to action. Plato holds that disembodied reason itself would merely contemplate motionlessly, it would never do anything. He says no man would ever act simply out of his theoretical intellectual conclusions. And therefore, in his view, the spirited or passional element is required to get a man moving, doing something on the basis of his rational conclusions. It's the thing that gives you the drive, the energy, the enthusiasm to go out into the world and fight for your values rather than merely sit back and contemplate them. Now, its proper function, of course, is to let itself be guided by reason. So it will act only for values sanctioned by reason, and will fight in battles only approved by reason. In other words, it has to align itself on the side of reason. And if so, says Plato, the man as a whole will have the virtue 
of courage. Now he calls it courage because he thinks of the spirited element as functioning most obviously in military campaigns. When a soldier is guided by reason, he will know exactly how much to endure, what to fear and what not to fear. He won't either roar out blindly, taking foolish risks, not knowing what he's doing, or on the other hand, turn yellow and turn tail and run when he should have stood his ground. In such a case, he'll be neither foolhardy nor cowardly, he will be courageous. And thus, Plato gets the second virtue, courage. As to the appetite of element, <coughs> It essentially performs the life-promoting functions. Essentially, it's the concern for food, sex, material, sustenance, physical goods. Now, this is the most dangerous element, because there is a chronic tendency on the part of the beast to spring. There is a chronic temptation to start enjoying these pursuits as pleasures in themselves, rather than merely as a means to promoting life. And therefore, the appetites come to dominate most men. Here again, says Plato, we must be guided by their function. We must never indulge in them as ends in themselves. We must willingly submit to the rule of reason. We must, to use Freudian terms, keep the lid on the id. <laughs> <laughs> and if you do this, you have virtue number three, temperance. Now, temperance, as used in Greece, does not mean complete abstinence. It doesn't have the same meaning as uh, the Women's Christian Temperance Union. But it's a little closer to that in Plato in particular, because he's a Platonist. Now, assume that these three parts are acting properly, as I've described. Each is doing its job. We have, in effect, a psychological division of labor. Each is doing what it is suited for and not interfering with the others. And the result is we have an integrated, harmonious personality. And then, says Plato, the man as a whole has the virtue of justice. He called it justice because the Greeks tended to think of justice not as one virtue among others, but as a synonym for virtue or good behavior in general. On the other hand, injustice or evil would be a lower part of the personality gaining control, seizing the reins and growing cancerously out of all proportion. So for instance, Plato would say that Hitler represents a cancer of the spirited element, the power luster, you see. <coughs> Or the Don Juan represents the cancer of the appetite of element. And I might say, Plato would equally say that an industrialist like Henry Ford Sr. represents a cancer of the appetite of element. Virtue, in a word, is cancer of some part of the soul, spiritual improper growth. And therefore, Plato's final answer to the sophists is, why shouldn't you live this way, the way the sophists say? Because you are killing yourself spiritually. You are undermining your soul. You are instituting a civil war which will lead to your destruction. And here you see he has given a fuller account of Socrates' view of the health of the soul. He's now developed that view into a whole theory of what the soul is and what parts it has and therefore how it should live. And he's done it by tying it to a whole overall metaphysical epistemological base. And if you now ask Plato the question with which he began the Republic, if you give a man the ring of Gyges, how should he live? When he can get away with murder if he wants, Plato would say, don't do it. Even if you could get away with it, it isn't worth it because you are obviously destroying yourself in the process. And notice, therefore, that Plato's answer to the sophists amounts to this. We have to turn away from the concerns of life on earth. We have to repress our passions and our appetites and concentrate on another super-reality. The choice these two schools offer you, in effect, is whim-worshipping subjectivism or otherworldly asceticism. And that is the alternative they offer. Plato does not say emotions are consequences of your premises. And if your premises are rational, your emotions will be rational and your personality stable and healthy. He says emotions are surd, irrational elements waiting to spring up and seize control. And health consists in sitting on them and not letting them get too violent. Now, the effects of Plato's view of human nature, and particularly of the nature and source of emotions, are overwhelming on subsequent Western civilization. I'll run through a few of the most blatantly obvious ones, but you could give a five-hour lecture just on this point alone. 
all of the following views are platonic in origin. To begin with, this implies a certain type of determinism, because you have no control over the content of your emotions, your likes, your dislikes, your feelings, your passions. They are independent of your thinking. They are thrust on you by your body. Consequently, you are helpless to change your character. If you happen to be born with strongly developed appetites, you are simply stuck with that kind of soul and there's nothing you can do. And this, for Plato, becomes the basis, as we'll see in a moment, for the division of men into three types with innately different uh, characters. Now, I should mention that Plato hints at certain points that in the other world you had a choice about which soul you were going to be born with. You picked your soul, so to speak, at the last moment before you came back around the next time. But that doesn't do you much good in this world. The second consequence. Since the passions in general are bad, and since all men necessarily feel them to some extent, there is an Achilles heel in human nature, a fundamental weakness. Man has emotions. Therefore, the ground is prepared for the theory of original sin for the theory that there is an inherent weakness, deficiency, evil, built into man at birth. Now, of course, in Plato, the metaphysical basis of this is the idea that anything in this world, man or banana or triangle, is imperfect, and therefore, and semi-real and contradictory, etc., and man, therefore, is imperfect, too. Later, of course, in the theological period, it was tricked up to be explained via Adam's original sin, but that simply is a mythological version of Platonism. Third, did you ever hear anybody say, if you advocated to them the view that you should live entirely by reason, oh well, how would that be possible? What about the emotional side of human nature? And if you ever heard that, that is platonic. The idea being, Emotions exist, they are basically antithetical to reason, and they demand some expression. And therefore, a completely rational man would have to be a man without emotions, which is impossible. Now, I remember years ago having a conversation with a Platonist, and I was taking the view that you should always act by reason. And he said to me, well, this is obviously impossible. Suppose you had a girl in a car and you were driving to the top of a mountain to look at the moon. Now, if you go by reason, what would you do? Discuss astronomy with her. <laughs> now, uh, you see, this is automatic Platonism on his part. He just routinely assumed that to be rational means to have no feelings, always to be impersonal, uh, etc. Reason is the anti-feeling, the anti-emotional. Not just simply the scrupulous observance of facts without using emotions as evidence, but the actual antithesis of emotion and that therefore reason requires the destruction of the emotions, which since it can't be done, then people can't live completely rationally. That platonic view is everywhere. Four, there is the grading of careers depending upon which part of the soul is most involved. Now, for instance, businessmen, industrialists, producers come out as very low types of people on this view, as against philosophers, or pure scientists, pure as against, you know, the uh, applied type, or pure mathematicians. Notice the word pure is a platonic legacy. They are uncorrupted, you see, by the crude physical concerns. They're off, according to this dichotomy, in their own super dimension. One of these is materialistic, appetitive, and therefore irrational. Now, of course, that's all over the place and influences every variety of intellectual. Uh, to take just a tiny example, the theory that the great American self-made capitalists are robber barons. Now, there's no evidence or documentation for such charges, but the historians who utter them and the people who accept them expect such tales to be true on philosophic grounds, because they know that they are dealing by definition with the low, depraved, irrational type of man. You see, they know that from Plato. And therefore, of course, what would you expect? And therefore, you don't have to scrutinize the evidence too carefully. You just get the Ford Foundation to finance a grant and come out with a few smears, and that's it. 
Now I should mention, just uh, for your own knowledge, that Plato himself did not include artists in the good side of this uh, particular career dichotomy. He had several reasons which I won't take the time to go into. But later Platonists included artists as being the spiritual as against the material side, and they also were elevated into this higher category. Of course, only so long as they're not popular, because if they're popular and their works sell, they're commercial, and that plunges them back down again. What's next? Five? What about the attitude to money and wealth? What about the idea that the love of money is the root of all evil? Here is Plato's description of how the true philosopher lives his life. None of them, none of the true philosophers, must possess any private property beyond the barest necessaries. You see private property being materialistic. Next, no one is to have any dwelling or storehouse that is not open uh, for all to enter at will. Their food uh, they will get in the quantities required by men of temperance and courage, and their wages fixed so that they will be just enough for the year with nothing left over. And they will have meals in common and all live together like soldiers in a camp. Gold and silver, we shall tell them, they will not need, having the divine counterparts of these metals always in their souls as a God-given possession, whose purity it is not lawful to sully by the acquisition of that mortal dross current among mankind, which has been the occasion of so many unholy deeds. They alone of all the citizens are forbidden to touch and handle silver or gold, or to come under the same roof with them, or wear them as ornaments, or drink from vessels made of them. This manner of life will be their salvation. What is Plato's view of sex? Well, I've alluded to it before, but I'll read you one brief passage. Another discussion, quote, is excessive pleasure, excessive pleasure now, compatible with temperance? Answer, how can it be when it unsettles the mind no less than pain? Is it compatible with virtue in general? Certainly not. It has more to do with insolence and profligacy? Yes. And is there any pleasure you can name that is greater and keener than sexual pleasure? Answer, no, nor any that is more like frenzy. Whereas love rightfully is such a passion as beauty combined with a noble and harmonious character may inspire in a temperate and cultivated mind. It must therefore be kept from all contact with licentiousness and frenzy. And where a passion of this rightful sort exists, the lover and his beloved must have nothing to do with the pleasure in question. Answer, certainly not, Socrates. It appears then that in this commonwealth we are founding, you will have a law to the effect that a lover may seek the company of his beloved uh, I should in interrupt to say that this is written in the discussion of homosexual love, but the principles are more broadly applicable. Uh, a lover may seek the company of his beloved, and with his consent, kiss and embrace him like a son with honorable intent, but must never be suspected of any further familiarity on pain of being thought, thought ill-bred and without any delicacy of feeling. Answer, I quite agree." Unquote. Now, let me say a word here once we're on love on what is Platonic love. Now, you might think from the passage I just wrote you that according to Plato, the thing to do is to love your beloved soul or character, even if not his body. But that isn't true. And Plato is very explicit on this. The, even the soul is too tied to this world. In another dialogue of his, the Symposium, that's the famous dialogue on Platonic love, Plato gives you instruction on how true love should operate, on platonic love. And the idea is you start with loving the body. That's the lowest kind of love, loving somebody's body. Then you proceed to love his soul or hers. And then you go to the next step and you come to recognize that after all, what you love in the body or the soul is its beauty and that the same beauty is common to a great many other things. The beauty of works of art, the beauty of scientific discoveries, the beauty of political laws, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> and so on. 
And so ultimately you see that the thing that you love is beauty as such, the form of beauty, not its particular embodiments. Platonic love, therefore, technically is the love of the form of beauty. And since the form of beauty is for all practical purposes the same as the form of the good, it's the same as love of the form of the good. It is a completely otherworldly love, and as is popularly understood, the phrase platonic love is much too earthly for Plato, the idea that you should love only the soul. You see, we have another ladder, an amatory ladder. All of Plato's philosophy is a series of ladders. In metaphysics, we have the ladder of being, from images to the half-real physical things to the lower forms to the good. In epistemology, we have a ladder of cognition, from imagining to belief to thinking to true knowledge. In now, we have a ladder of love, from a particular body to a particular soul to a whole bunch of concrete instances of beauty wherever they may be found to the form of beauty itself. And just as the senses awaken us in us the remembrance of the forms that we had in a previous life, Similarly, the perception of physical beauty, which excites sexual desire, also revives in the soul the memory of the perfect beauty that it contemplated in a former existence. And once you recollect this beauty, that inspires in you a yearning for the higher life associated with the world of forms. And therefore, sexual love and the yearning for the form of beauty really derive from one basic impulse. But the trouble is, says Plato, that most men settle for the lowest, crudest, most vulgar form of its satisfaction, namely sex, or at most personal love of other individual human beings, whereas properly their love should be for the ineffable pinnacle of the world of forms, which of course later became the view that the supreme virtue is love of God. Please explain in more detail the parallels between the Platonic and the Freudian theories of personality and the nature of the objectivist objections to the Freudian constructions. And I had many questions on this. Well, you could give a whole lecture on that, but I'll give a minute and a half. In essence, the difference is this. They're both, of course, wrong, but there's a big difference in the nature of the errors. For Plato, the supreme element of the three is reason. Now, granted that he ultimately defines reason in mystical terms. Nevertheless, it's the, the mind, the thinking faculty, the part that judges and comes to conclusions, and that to some extent uses logic, at least on the lower stages. Uh, for uh, Freud, reason is demoted to the middle level of the trinity. It is the, essentially the ego. It has exclusively a mediating function. Uh, between two alternatives, so far from being the ruler of the personality as in Plato, it is just a little helpless puppet shunted back and forth between the other two. So that is a profoundly more anti-rational view. And in addition, what is the nature of the third element in Freud? Plato at least has two emotional elements, both of which represent you, your emotions, and one rational element. So to that extent, there's a certain individualism about it. It's all parts of you. Freud, however, has the id, which is your, pa your innate, uh, depraved passion, the ego, which is essentially your thinking, reasoning faculty, and the superego, which is the mores of society which you have interjected and made a part of you. In other words, for Freud, your basic conflict does not even involve reality or reason, not even mystically conceived. The conflict is not, as in Plato, between passion and reason, but between arbitrary passion and arbitrary society, between feeling and people, with reality dropped out of the picture altogether. Now, this is an infinitely more corrupt trichotomy and could not have been formulated until the 19th century after Kant would have been impossible philosophically before reality was pushed out of the picture altogether by Kant. As to the nature of the objectivist objections to Freudian constructions, well, I wouldn't even know where to start. The first thing is it's all constructions. In other words, 
arbitrary, baseless, senseless, ungrounded, irrational dogma made up as he went along with the actual observational evidence twisted to support the most bizarre theories of Oedipus complex of the death instinct, etc. It is, of course, completely deterministic, and objectivism objects on that ground. Insofar as it advocates instinct, which is essential to it, it is an, a Platonist, represents the theory of innate ideas, since in fact all drives to action presuppose knowledge or awareness. Any such theory as innate motivation or innate drives means innate ideas. And therefore, those are just uh, a couple of obvious things on the face of it. But I, my actual feeling with regard to Freud is what I would say if someone said to me, what is your objection to Santa Claus? And my answer to that would be, of course, Santa Claus is a much more benevolent figure, but my answer <laughs> to that would be, what is your reason in favor of him? The onus of proof is on the man who asserts that something exists. And uh, until such evidence comes up, it's a philosophic mistake to dignify it by treating it sufficiently seriously to try to refute it. If you have a, a basically appetite of soul, is it possible for you to succeed in, your, in converting yourself to a moral life, or are you doomed, in effect, to immorality by the nature of your soul? Now, that's a good question. And Plato, I think, would incline to answer it both yes and no. Yes, from the point of view that he does not feature the deterministic element implicit in his philosophy. He wants to suggest that men are really free and that they're responsible for what they are. But no, in the sense that he does believe you have an innate character, and as apart from the state molding you, there's nothing you can do about it. So he, like the whole of Western religion that grew out of him, has in effect one foot in the free will camp and one foot in the determinist camp. And you'll see that pattern repeatedly throughout religion. On the one hand, for instance, Adam had to have free will because otherwise it makes a mockery of God's uh, punishing him for his original sin. On the other hand, God is all powerful according to Christianity and actually determined everything that happens. And therefore, he himself is the cause of Adam's sin. And therefore, of course, Adam had no choice. And Christianity juggles those two desperately with every possible device to try to make sense of it, and of course can't.